welcome uh, to, to the Institute and today to today's uh, topic, <coughs> managing climate-related financial risk. Um, we have uh, uh, two speakers, or two contributors, um, uh, Benoit Lugue, uh, who is Chief Executive Officer, and Ian Cochran, who is Director of the Programme in Finance, Investment and Climate at the Institute for Climate Economics in Paris. Um, uh, Benoit has been explaining uh, to me over lunch uh, the background uh, to the Institute. I'm keen that he gives you a flavour of it, but perhaps not going back as far yeah, as, as no, Napoleon. The topic, uh, the theme today, um, uh, the whole issue of, of uh, the financing of the necessary changes and transitioning of our societies to a carbon-free world. Uh, a very challenging one, and uh, Benoit is going to set the set the, uh, context for us, and then hopefully we'll have time for a decent period of time for discussion. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, okay, uh, I guess uh, I will say about um, a couple of words about the institution which I manage, which is I foresee the Institute for Climate Economics uh, we were created. Uh, can possibly were created uh, two years ago, but we had longer history. And uh, we stem from Caisse de Depot, which is a French public long-term investor. There is no equivalent in Ireland, as far as we know, and not in the Anglo-Saxon world, as far as we know, but basically we, we come from a French public financial institution. Today, uh, for the past two years, we've been, we've been a non-for-profit institution um, sponsored by Caisse de Depot on one hand, and the French Development Agency, the French Environment Agency, and uh, the Caisse de Depot Gestion, which is uh, the, um, uh, the, the equivalent in, um, in Morocco of the, Caisse, the French Caisse de Depot. So in a nutshell, what we do and what we work on, um, what we do, uh, we provide analysis and research on the economics of climate change, or should I say, the economics of the transition to a low carbon and climate resilient economy. So we're economists. I'm an economist myself. I'm not from the financial sector at all. So if you start talking about finance, I will pass it on to Ian. Uh, I'm also an engineer by training. So I was first trained as an engineer, ocean science, etc., and then I became a very bad economist because I was a very bad engineer to start with. <laughs> uh, uh, so what we do, uh, analysis and research, we're not academics. So what we do is basically grey literature, think tank kind of thing. Uh, we, everything we do is public. So please have a look at our website and download our publications and uh, read them, criticize them if you want to, etc. Uh, it's all open for the public debate. Public debate is basically our DNA. We're here to feed into the public debate, uh, provide ideas, um, provide analysis. We don't do any advocacy, lobbying, etc. Uh, we're not here for that, but we're here basically to assist other people to do their own lobbying, etc. And uh, in between the... Um, the analysis and the uh, public debate, what we do is uh, we provide capacity building services, so to speak. In other words, we try to um, motivate people into understanding what the stakes are for the energy transition. Um, so anything from education to uh, building tools to help people uh, moving from the what shall I do to how shall I do it. It will hopefully become a little bit clearer if you have questions during the Q&A session, but if not, just keep this in mind. We provide tools, um, capacity building in broad sense. We work on four different thematic areas, three or four. Um, Ian is leading the finance, investment and climate. Uh, there is also a branch dedicated to industry, energy and climate, which focuses quite heavily on carbon pricing and interaction between carbon pricing and other policies. And we have a branch called, let's say, Territories and Climate Subnational Action. Um, just to make a long story short, that's basically agriculture, forestry, cities, infrastructure. Um, so basically, so, so that kind of land use planning. Yeah, land use in the broad sense, okay. that is, including the built environment, yeah. uh, okay. not only the rural environment, which is possibly very dear to Ireland, but there are yes. also some other <laughs> areas that, that, we, that we're looking to. So everything we do is public. We have a Twitter account, a website, etc. Have a look at them uh, if you want to. Uh, so, uh, just to focus maybe on what we're going to focus on today, uh, the finance, investment, and climate part. Uh, so, we have a number of works of streams that we work on. Um, Ian will possibly uh, share some more insight into what we do if you have questions uh, after <coughs> if you want to do it right now. No, just for the interest of time, it's fine to work uh, four different areas that could be of interest to you. Um, the landscape of domestic climate finance, what we try to do is we'll try, we'll try to track domestic climate finance in France. 
and provide a landscape of benefit possibly to the French government and to other people. Uh, we work on mainstreaming within uh, financial institutions, within mostly development finance institutions, but also, I would say, uh, national development banks, for example. Uh, we look into uh, risks uh, for financial institutions as well, climate-related risks, obviously. And uh, we also look into climate financial instruments, such as green bonds, credit lines, etc. Uh, I mean, if it doesn't ring a bell to you, no worries, and if it does... Uh, Ian will be happy to answer any <laughs> questions. <laughs> okay, um, so um, to be honest, we don't know how much you know about um, Paris Agreement, climate change, etc. So we decided to start quite low uh, and we'll try to crank up, um, I mean to speed up uh, during the presentation. What is in the Paris Agreement? How many of you have read the Paris Agreement? Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> okay, how many of you haven't read the Paris Agreement? Not, not to be ashamed of. Okay, okay. So in case you haven't read the 29 articles of the Paris Agreement, just read Article 2. That's possibly the most important article. It sets out the target. And if, you, if you're in a, at a dinner in Dublin, for example, and you need to talk about the Paris Agreement, just say, oh yeah, it's about aligning climate development and finance. That's all you need to know. And people will say, oh, <laughs> good. Okay. All you need to know about the Paris Agreement, and in Article 2, there's three targets. Um, the first target is to limit global warming well below 2 degrees, blah, blah, blah. And in Article 4, there's a small mention of what it means. Uh, concretely, it means bringing the world down to zero net emissions. Um, has it written before the end of the century? It's, um, in the second half. In the second, second half, half, thanks. That's, that's not minimal. I mean, in the second half of the century, depending, depending on how you interpret this uh, second half of the century to bring zero net emissions. Keep this in mind, zero net emissions. What does it mean for the world, for Ireland, for whatever, blah, blah, blah. Second target, increase the ability to, um, to promote low carbon and climate resilient development. Every word counts, in other words, development uh, counts as much as low carbon and climate resilient. Development first, possibly. And the third target is making financial flows consistent with previous targets. Financial flows consistent with. Today, uh, in case you don't know, we live in a world where financial flows are highly inconsistent with those two targets. So how to move from this to that, making consistent aligning flows. All you need to know, that's a 10-line article, maybe a bit more, 20-line article. Read it uh, tonight if you haven't done so, uh, so you will see that it's in a pact agreed on by a number of countries. So, in practice, what does that mean? Um, towards a zero net emissions basically means this. Today we are, over there, in case you can't see it, roughly 50 gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year, and we need to bring the world down to just about zero in, say, 60, 70, 80 years. Okay, from 50 gigatons of CO2 equivalent to zero, net. Not gross, net. Okay, uh, for those of you who like figures, the area below the curve represents roughly 1,000 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. Today we emit 50 gigatons, so 1,000 divided by 50 is 20. So if we keep our emissions at the same level, in 20 years we close the tap. And we're below 2 degrees, if not, we have a shoot and we go above 2 degrees. If we decide to reduce our emissions, then we have a little bit more time, but before the end of the century, in the second half of the century, just to use the word with the Paris Agreement, we need to bring the world down to zero net emissions. Now, how to do that? Uh, well, possibly, possibly you have a number of ideas as how to do that, promote energy efficiency, renewable energy, uh, decarbonized energy vectors, in other words. Um, that's possibly in the, on the less inside and possibly more outside. You can possibly think about carbon capture and storage, if you like technology, carbon capture and usage. You can also think about forestry and agriculture, which is a quite inefficient but highly, uh, um, let's say it's inefficient because it wasn't uh, used for sequestering carbon to start with, but it works quite well. It's been working for a number of billion years, so possibly it could also be one avenue to look at. So what does that mean? 1,000 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. Uh, this is just to provide, uh, to move into the financial sector, uh, from a financial sector perspective, this is the carbon budget that we have if we want to stay below 2 degrees, right? Roughly 1,000 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. That is uh, 
the CO2 emissions that would be attributable to burning all the reserves, no reserves of gas, oil, and coal. Conclusion, when you look at this graph, well, if we want to respect this carbon budget, and that's a political choice, we might decide to go over two degrees, or three, or four, etc. If we want to stay within two degrees, then obviously we can burn all the gas that is available, or all the oil, or a combination of the two, who will have to keep some coal on the ground, unless we come up with a magic wand solution that sucks out the CO2 from the atmosphere. Question to you guys, if I invest in a coal, oil, and gas company, what would be the value, the long-term value of such a company? First question to you guys, if I were an investor. So the fossil awesome sectors are at risk of losing their value. But then again, that is, if we don't come up with a large-scale, magical solution. <coughs> uh, question to you guys, what's the proportion of energy that we use today in our economy that is of fossil origin? Roughly. 90... 95. No, a little less, a little less, 80%. But the remaining 20% is like um, traditional biomass, which is utterly oh. unsustainable. Uh, so if we only look at the fossil fuel part, the bulk of our economy is sustainable because we use fossil fuel today. So if we don't have this anymore, what happens to the value of the economy as a whole? Question to you guys. It's an open question. It's not, well, I don't have any answer. Just, you know, trying to trigger um, questions and possibly um, elements of answers. So part of, well, if we decide to, to go for uh, to this two degree, possibly some sectors will be at risk. I mentioned the gas, oil, and coal sector because it's the most visible sector. But then again, we're talking about the whole economy that would possibly need to be changed. Second thing, uh, how many of you have read the Stern report in 2006? Yes, yes we have. <laughs> okay, the conclusion of Stern, you probably know it, uh, in case of extremely rapid climate change, we are at risk of losing, let's say, 20% of well-being, assuming the GDP is a measure of well-being, etc. 20%. Well, that's massive. Uh, Stern was criticized by a number of economists, including Nordhaus, which is equally respect, respected, for uh, not taking the proper discount rates into account in, um, in, in his computations, and by basically making the case that climate change was serious, uh, he used a very low um, discount rate and was criticized by your house. 20%, that's massive, right? A loss of 20% of GDP. That's the equivalent of a financial crisis, right? Okay, question to you guys. I mentioned I'm an economist by training, but before that, I was an engineer. So that's the economist part of my brain speaking right now. And uh, the engineering part of my brain will kick in right now. This is Dublin 20,000 years ago. 20,000 years ago, um, that's a number of individuals. Uh, there was a number of individuals on this picture who do not exist any longer. Question to you guys, uh, how low, how lower was the temperature at the, at the global level compared to today? Two degrees? Four, four. Yeah, five degrees, five degrees. The global temperature was lower, five degrees lower than what it is today, and that was 20,000 years ago. So uh, we gained uh, five degrees in 20,000 years. Okay, and Stern and Likes are saying, okay, if extremely rapid climate change, that means basically plus five degrees in 200 years. A hundred times faster, then we're only going to lose 20% of the GDP. Do you believe it? I don't know, but you know, the engineering part of my brain has a hard time believing this when I see that. Okay, the question is the economic science uh, so sound that we know that we're only going to lose 20% of the GDP or is more at risk? Open question to you guys. Then again, I'm not here to scare you, you know, just, <laughs> just trying to, uh, you know, to provide, uh, provide, to get on so that you can think for yourselves. So my message here is the costs of an action are very likely to be underestimated. I didn't go into the details of uh, Stern's uh, review in his... Um, computations, etc., but it's very likely that it's very underestimated. Okay, uh, so we've talked about some risks and that some sectors are facing if we go uh, to the two-degree pathway, and also some risks, some risks due to climate change, the climate change that is foreseeable if we don't change our ways. So uh, the main message here is that we will have to deal with climate risks 
will become inevitable in the coming years. Either we decide to keep emitting, or it has gases and we will possibly have to deal with physical risks, or we decide to bring our, our world down to net zero in terms of emissions, and we'll possibly have to deal with transition risks. In other words, uh, some sectors will be at risk of seeing abrupt uh, changes in their environment. If we don't do any of those, we'll possibly have to deal with physical and transition risks alike. So it's not me saying this, it's the UK Prudential Regulation Authority. Uh, so some, well, the buddy that you might have heard of, uh, but basically um, there are uh, national prudential regulators saying, okay, we have a problem with climate change. We have some risks that we have to deal with. Okay, uh, now if we go into the detail, what do we mean exactly by physical risks from a financial perspective? Uh, there is acute physical risks. Maria, for example, is one example. I mean, the hurricanes in, in, in the Caribbean is one um, example. But there is more chronic, think about the mammoths uh, that I presented on the previous slides. There is possibly a longer term trend in terms of climate change, uh, which uh, induces some changes in temperature, rainfall patterns, uh, soil moisture, etc., which could have an impact on many sectors in the economy. Talking about transition risks, uh, there is also many risks that need to be addressed. Um, policy and legal, if countries start acting and follow uh, the route um, that is um, envisaged in the Paris Agreement, there will be possibly some increase in greenhouse gas pricing, for example, in policy and climate change related policy. Market risk, because we can also see some changing market behaviors. Uh, technology, uh, who wants to be the next Kodak? Uh, Kodak didn't see you know, a looming technology. Um, they said, okay, you know, people will keep shooting pictures with their cameras. Yeah, we still shoot pictures with our camera cameras, but the technology is totally different. Same could go for low carbon technologies. If we have a new technology, think about, uh, let's try to, uh, that's a good example. Uh, think about LEDs, for example. How many people knew LEDs 10 years ago? Okay. Computer scientists or what? Engineer. Engineer, yeah. okay. <laughs> well, apart from a few um, IT specialists, new one thought that LEDs could be used for lighting. Same thing, uh, if I told you 10 years ago you would send all your emails from a smartphone, you would have said, what are the smartphones for? What's a smartphone to start with? A phone is for making phone calls. 20 years ago, the same sentence would have attracted <coughs> comments such as, what is an email? Okay, so we have some technology changes. We just don't foresee the same thing for low-carbon technologies. Reputation, um, well, it's starting to move uh, to a certain extent. Uh, some sectors just don't want to be stigmatized and uh, you know, just pointed uh, the fingers at it. Uh, so what does that mean for financial actors? Well, all those who focus on transition risks, for example, um, climate policies, blah, 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 etc., this has an impact on cash flows, on balance sheets, and uh, possibly on the litigation and responsibility side. Uh, you didn't deal with climate change, you managed the money poorly, uh, we are going to sue you. That's the kind of thing that could go under the litigation and responsibility risk. Now, uh, all this is for the sustainable development people, and now we move into the uh, financial department people, possibly more serious people, uh, they talk about credit risks, market risks, and liquidity risks. This could have an impact on that. And that's when serious people start to kick in. Okay, we have a risk, we need to deal with it. I can this is an adapted version of a graphic coming out of the French Treasury Ministry for just to kind of really uh, demonstrate that it's something that's not staying at the Environmental Ministry right now, which so it is, at least in France, a huge sea change in terms of attention. Just for your, um, and so that you know, it's people at the Ministry of Finance are not interested in the environment. They're interested about in financial stability, full stop. Our own research finds the same. <laughs> yeah, well, now they are convinced that there are some links between the two. But the, uh, financial stability is all that matters. So here we need to talk about financial stability and nothing else. Um, so, well, I mean, talking about systemic risks is maybe a little premature, but still, some people are starting to say, okay, we might have a major risk looming. You possibly know this person. Yes, okay, I see many people nodding. Okay, Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England. I love this sentence. Once climate kind of change becomes a defining issue for financial stability, it may already be too late. 
He talks about financial stability. We don't know what Mark Carney believes, uh, if he believes or not in time of change. He talks about financial stability. That's his job, full stop. The sentence is beautiful because it, it says, at the same time, we're going to hit the wall. But he says, we might. And there's still a glimmer of hope, saying, OK, there's possibly still time for action. Uh, a number of publications that you might want to read on quantitability of the Bank of England and um, the digit of the French Treasury, which issued, if you read French, uh, they issued. There is an English version as well, yeah. Excellent. Those people are fantastic. Uh, there's, uh, it says assessment of the risks, uh, the climate change related risks in the banking sector. Could be a useful read. Um, so, if we had a look at what's going on in the financial sphere today, uh, some people are moving, I'm not going to say it's mainstream, but Ian, just feel free to contradict me if uh, you believe uh, I'm not right. It's not mainstream, but some people, like Mark Carney and Likes, are talking about climate change, not from a climate ch change perspective, but from their own perspective, financial stability or others. So three initiatives you might uh, want to know about. At the international level, there is an initiative led by the G20 and the Financial Stability Board, uh, you possibly have heard about it, the task force of the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure. At the European level, uh, the European equivalent, let's say, is led by DG FISMA and its uh, H so the High Level Expert Group on Sustainable Finance. They published a report in July 2017, and the final report is due by the end of this year. When is it? Um, yeah, the December. December. December the conclusions are only called the December, and then the final report report, I think, in January next year. Okay, so it could be a useful read as well. Uh, I mean, it's taken quite seriously at the European level, and then again, not by DG Klima or DG Environment. Uh, I have profound respect for those people, but DG FISMA is possibly a little bit more listened to by, uh, by financial actors. In France, uh, we were talking over lunch on being proud of what our uh, own countries are doing in terms of climate change. Well, I believe this is a quite interesting innovation at the French level. Article 173 of the Energy and Transition Law, basically it's an article that requires uh, listed companies, asset managers and investors to disclose some kind of financial related, uh, some kind of related financial information. So it's not saying what they should disclose, but at least you know it's just putting uh, ideas on the table and saying, okay, you might want to have information on that, you might want to disclose information on that, blah, blah, blah. At least you need to disclose something about climate change, how you deal with it, etc. If you don't disclose it, some people will ask you, why didn't you disclose anything? Not an issue. No, no, it's not an issue, it's too serious not to be an issue. Do you think they're going to lie? Do you think they're going to lie about this? Uh, what, is, what is your take on that? It's, we're talking about financial regulation. In mm -hmm. other words, if you lie, you're not going to be sued on environmental reasons. You're going to be sued on financial regulation reasons. Do you want to lie to the regulators? You might. I mean, it's risk. Yeah. It's, uh, that's how, I think that's how financial crisis happens. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> they, they lie to. They lie at a certain level, but this conduct. I mean, some people. You know, it's it's all about disclosure. So uh, you can decide to lie, but some people might check. Uh, and then again, uh, you don't have to do or say anything. But for example, just to give, uh, to give a concrete example, if a large oil company says, okay, climate change, not an issue for me. Okay, you can say, mm, are you sure? And as an investor, you might want to talk about it to the large oil company and say, okay, what is your long-term plan in terms of climate change? Do you have any vision? If not, your decision as an investor might be to pull out. Not because you like environmental climate change, but because you don't like risk. So, okay, this company has no vision, I'm going to pull out, just to manage my risk. Okay, so Article 173 uh, is possibly a nice innovation at the French level. So if uh, you want to have a look at what it says precisely, and copy and paste, and possibly improve it, that would be, uh, that would be a nice addition to the um, Irish uh, regulation and legislation policy. <coughs> Um, at the financial sector level, there is a number of, of initiatives. So we, in this line, we focused on what investors are doing today. Then again, it is not the main thing. I'm not saying that everyone is on board, but an increasing number of people are actually uh, looking at the issue. So we've uh, put a number of uh, items right here. Talking about climate change when you're an investor is not only about having a great portfolio, in other words, investing in a bit of renewable windmills, uh, hydro, etc. 
that's only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, you can also try to disclose information about climate change or ask the companies you invest in to disclose information. You can try to decarbonize your portfolio, possibly to hedge a risk uh, and to manage a risk against um, uh, to degree pathways, for example. You can also um, engage, and there is a number of initiatives right here. You can also engage, and that's basically what the IGCC is doing. Uh, engage is going to this large oil company I was talking about and say, okay, you don't have a vision on climate change. Before I pull out, do you have anything to say? And then see what the large oil or any other sector at risk uh, company responds and say, okay, I will pull out or not. I will try to influence your strategic decision making. We can also, uh, if you want to go all the way to uh, the most, uh, I mean, the hardest form of engagement, you can decide to divest. In other words, pull out from any fossil fuel or any other at risk, um, I mean, sector at risk that you might uh, think of. The policy sector is also quite active. I mentioned the Article 173 in the French law. I uh, possibly looked at the inquiry um, on the, into the design of the sustainable financial system report. So basically, all those initiatives uh, are existing today. I'm not talking about something which is looming at the horizon. It's existing today. Some people are thinking about how to manage risk, how to reduce the risk posed by climate change. And then again, the main message right here, it's not only about greening your portfolio and saying, okay, I'll buy a little bit more renewables. It's about revisiting the whole investment strategy. Uh, in our view, uh, Combining <coughs> strategies in portfolio with two degree target, uh, two degree pathway could be the best management strategy. Three reasons for that. First reason is that there is a Paris Agreement. I talked about it. You might not believe it, uh, but our take is that governments, um, not only the US, but also other governments, will increasingly look at what they can do in the Paris Agreement for a number of reasons. Uh, if you have questions about it, we'll be happy to answer them. The second question is also because of the financial sphere and regulators are increasingly looking into climate change issues, not from an environment perspective, but from a whatever financial stability or whatever their uh, realm of regulation is perspective. Third reason is, um, as uh, people in the financial sector say, uh, don't put all your eggs in the same basket. You, won't, you might want to manage risks and hence bet a little bit on the energy transition and not so much on the mainstream economy that we know today. What does that mean? What does aligning economic strategies and portfolios with 2D pathway mean? Um, many things. Uh, there's many um, uncertainties, basically. The most radical uncertainty is which development strategy are we going to follow at the global level? What are countries going to do? Are we going on a 2D <coughs> pathway or possibly on a plus 6 degree pathway? Who knows? If you know, please let us know. That would be of great interest to us. Uh, so that's the main type of uncertainty. Which pathway are we heading uh, on today? And there's the more usual uncertainty. Which technologies, etc. How are we going to achieve a certain pathway? Which technologies shall, shall we bet on? I'm almost done. Don't worry. Just for the sake of time. <laughs> um, so uh, in terms of uncertainty, dealing with uncertainty, there is uh, a, a number of things you might want to keep in, in the back of your heads. Uh, the main message here is beware of dead ends if zero net emissions is the target. There is a number of technologies which are totally incompatible with a two-degree world. We know that. I mean, so this is basically the emission path pathway. That's the start of the emission pathway for a two-degree world. Question to you guys, any room for coal in a two-degree world? Open question. The answer is yes, no, maybe, depending on which technology we come up with to suck out CO2 from the atmosphere. But if we don't come up with this technology, there is supposed to be very, very, very little room for coal. Uh, a car. Any room for a thermal engine car in a two-year world for everybody? Nope. Maybe a thermal engine car for a happy few people. Maybe um, a zero emission vehicle for everybody, etc. But a thermal engine car for everybody just doesn't work. Not in the two year world. Question, uh, is this animal uh, has any, uh, what's the life expectancy of such an animal in the two degree world? Now, I took this example for Owen. Uh, it's quite um, 
high emitting vehicle, uh, so to speak, uh, this little animal emits roughly three tons of CO2 equivalent per year. So the question is, is it sustainable in a two degree pathway? I don't know. It's a question uh, how much meat are we going to eat, to eat uh, in 50 years? So that's open questions. I mean, we don't have answers to that, but basically all those technologies, quote unquote, uh, might disappear in a two degree world. We just don't know which technologies are going to succeed and which technologies are not going to succeed. And, and this, then again, is a technology. There's many ways you can get protein, uh, not necessarily cows. Well, if I were speaking from a public policy perspective, which is basically what I usually do, um, keep this in mind. For those of you who know about the economy in the room, and I hope there's a, there a number of you, uh, the main message here, <coughs> if I speak to economists, is the cheapest emission reduction available today is certainly not the best policy option to pursue. Because reaching zero net emissions is the ultimate target. So if you start with the cheap options, there's a high possibility that you never, never, ever, ever get to the target. Just to give a very concrete example, refurbishment of um, uh, buildings, retrofitting buildings. If you start only by doing what is economically viable today under today's economic conditions, you will never, ever make it. So even if it's more expensive than what the market, quote unquote, says, we need to start today if we want to have a chance of achieving the target tomorrow. So that's counterintuitive. Uh, so that's a small kick to the McKinsey uh, marginal banking cost curve. Don't believe it. Uh, I mean, don't go up the marginal banking cost curve. There is policy options that we need to pursue today even if they're more expensive. Which, by the way, brings another question. The market delivers short-term signals, marginal prices, and basically policies. The policy's job would be to influence the market, quote unquote, to deliver longer-term average costs, which is what is of interest to us. We need to have to reduce costs over the next 60, 70, 80 years in average, mm -hmm. not at the margin, if we want to keep it uh, cheap. Um, sorry, that was the economics bits of my presentation. So um, just to wrap up, um, how are we contributing to, to, to the debate and discussions around climate risks? We, we have a number of projects we are involved in today, um, and Ian will be much more uh, vocal about what he does, because it's basically, do you want to I present this? Or? Um, I mean, yeah, just in a couple of words today, I mean, Ben has given a very kind of rough overview of a very complex topic today. So in terms of how I foresee is attempting to move forward on these topics, it's really about ensuring as we move forward and developing the metrics needed to assess different types of economic actors, portfolios, strategies, that we're asking the right questions. And that given that there's a lot of actors that do also see now commercial consulting <laughs> opportunities in terms of developing these tools and metrics and rolling them out for the financial sector, are we asking the questions that allow us to evaluate assets and evaluate different strategies to see whether or not they're on a two degree pathway on whatever type of uh, management strategy we have in place. So on our end, um, beyond the risk, beyond the work that Benoit presented at the beginning, which is more related to the sectoral policy frameworks that make um, different investments profitable or feasible, um, we're also looking at a number, a, men, a number of the risk related areas. So we've published a set, a small set of policy briefs on transition risks. So what can financial actors do today to start looking at these questions with the available data and metrics and where we see the most um, promising areas of development for these type of metrics are. Those are available on our website. Um, we tried to be paperless today, so sorry, we have nothing for you to take home with you other than a web website address and some ideas. Um, but we're also involved in a EU H2020 uh, H project looking at how do you develop scenarios to assess different um, uh, sectors in terms of their alignment with uh, more or less the different scenarios of um, climate action, so these transition risks. On the physical risk side, we're going to be kicking off a project um, in the next month looking at how do you take information on the physical aspects of climate change and interpret that into a language that's useful for investors. Because there's a lot of uncertainty and oft often um, the meteorological community isn't quite in a position to talk to the financial community. So we're working together with a consortium of actors to look at that. Um, and then we'll also be kicking off a project starting um, in a couple months as well 
um, with CDP at looking at how do we need to think about disclosure, so reimagining disclosure for companies in terms of what information they need to be given to both their shareholders and the broader financial community of their exposure to both physical climate risks and trends policy related risks um, within everybody's investment uh, horizons, which of course vary quite significantly depending if you're a day trader or a public investor. Um, and then overall, and actually we'll probably throw that back to Benoit if there's any questions on that, I foresee is also involved in an initiative to establish a benchmark, not an evaluation, but a benchmark to think about whether or not different financial centers are on um, a track, whether it's the right one is a question, but on track to integrating these issues into what they're doing um, and how they're, the, the ecosystem, which is a term we like to see used as well, um, of actors are taking these climate-related issues on board.